Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, special uh, program uh, for the MBS in the Ministry of Culture this time uh, presents the Post Electoral, a series of interviews uh, taking in consideration the last general uh, election in the North Pacific where we're going to interview each of the candidates and uh, their thoughts during the election and most specifically tonight we have with us a uh, ghost, the winner of the delegate race and current delegate of the North Pacific, and we will ask them uh, the thoughts of their results and uh, their their expect uh, what they expect to do within the term. So, good evening, ghost. Well, it's still afternoon for me, but you know, big time zone difference. Uh, nice to see you. So, um, let's start from the very beginning. Let's start with, uh, why did you uh, run for Delegate? Well, there's a lot of stuff going on right now in nation states, and I really wanted to make sure that the progress we made with Mad Jack uh, would continue. Uh, we are obviously not technically at war, but we have a very warlike uh position right now against uh, the Brotherhood of Malice and there's a lot of stuff with that and challenges that are being made to us and, and our foreign policy and what we want to accomplish and uh, I did not feel it was the time for a less experienced newcomer to step up and deal with all of that. It's, it's going to be a lot of stuff and I wanted to make sure that the region had a highly experienced uh, option, especially one that was in the government that just uh, concluded. So that's why I stepped forward. It's a lot like why I came back the third time I was delegate. So uh, in the sake for newcomers and new people who, maybe uh, listeners to the to the MBS who want to keep up with uh, the North Pacific news by our channel or just new people around the North Pacific, could you explain a bit of the whole... Um, what happens with the Brotherhood of Mali since you characterize it as a close to war as a close to war thing that is happening? Could you explain it a bit to the newcomers? Okay, simply put, uh, this very old raider organization that has reconstituted itself and decided to get active again, bringing back a bunch of old raiders from the past, uh, decided that one of their first moves was going to be raiding Stargate, which of course is one of our oldest allies, and a region that we have been very clear over the years is off limits and you do not mess with it. They've decided to mess with it uh, by now at least four times. So they, they didn't just stop with the first one. And um, they did a pretty much every single thing you can imagine to antagonize us and uh, try to get under our skin. So we have been dealing with that for, I would say, the last... I don't know what it is now. At least a month and a half, if not two months by now. Basically, the end of Magic's delegacy was just them doing this stuff all the time. And uh, we, obviously, being an independent region, uh, have raided before, but uh, this is all on the heels of a alignment change decision that was made um, early in Magic's second term where we were going to focus more on defender operations, which is part of why some raiders decided to mess with us, because we were, in their view, going defender, which is not accurate, but that's a slightly different discussion. And in order to uh, kind of emphasize that position that we have, uh, there's another aspect of it that was always important even before that alignment change, but it's definitely important now. It's certain types of raids we've never been comfortable with we've never accepted very destructive raids ones that seek to completely annihilate a region and and just erase it as opposed to say raiding it or occupying it for a few days and you know it being a temporary thing this is a, a kind of a shift in raider raiding culture that if the brotherhood gets their way i i fear will become more common and some of the other raider organizations we have worked with in the past before maybe we'll follow their lead and we'll see a very uh, ugly side of raiding we haven't seen since well before I was ever delegate. From very early on in the 
in the campaign. Uh, you were, uh, if I do not recall, uh, let me just check for a moment. If I am correct, you were one of the first, if not the first person to uh, say your, uh, declare your candidacy and confirm your candidacy to to delegate. Yes, you were the first to confirm your candidacy to delegate. And from very early on, you were kind of put on by the by the community at large as a big favorite. Um, do you think that has to do with your uh, very long history within the region and your status as a security counselor? Um, that's reasonable, but you said you checked this because if I'm not mistaken, I got beat to the punch by Dredton, who announced like they, a uh, month before the election in, in the RMB that he was going to be running for delegate, and uh, I definitely did not announce that early. Since they rejected the candidacy, I didn't count on them. I was counting on the persons who were who ended up in the ballot. Ah, yes. Well, among those people, yeah, I, I definitely beat the others to the punch on, on that one. But yeah, um, I, I still very much consider Dredton to have been a legitimate candidate. He was out there for weeks before the election, if not months even. And... Uh, you know, had a whole thing planned. So, yeah, he did. He did have to drop out, but uh, he definitely was th there first. So, him running, um, not really a consideration for my run, and I don't think anybody else considering me. Uh, former delegates that are still active are always going to be on the short list. People are always going to be aware of the possibility they will jump in. When I ran for delegate originally, that was also true. You know, we had former delegates lurking around, and we thought they might come back. And that's always a fear you have as a new candidate, is that someone like uh, like an MCM, or I guess like a me now, is going to jump in and uh, basically suck all the oxygen out of the room. So uh, I, I personally, I believe most former delegates share my philosophy about this, which is that we try not to just jump in willy-nilly for no good reason. If we're coming back, it's because we think we have something very valuable to offer and the timing kind of makes it uh, crucial that we make ourselves available to run. So I certainly don't like to, you know, just scratch my own ego. I wouldn't do it unless I thought that it was really important that someone like me was available for the region to choose. And they are, of course, free not to choose. But, you know, if they're going to look at my, my long record being on the Security Council, whatever... Of course that's relevant, and I definitely think that that comes in, but, you know, that delegate, the incumbent advantage for delegates when they run for a second term, I think, to a lesser extent, still exists when they decide to run in a f future point, even if it's, in my case, you know, been three years since I last ran. Uh, your biggest competitor, as it has been shown by the uh, results, uh, the second that came in second, was uh, Lord uh, Dominator. What is your What are your thoughts on Lord Dominator's um, platform? I think it was the best platform that he's ever put out because he was actually trying, and it was very nice to see, you know, to get a, a clear sense of of what he could bring to the table. Because most of the time, his campaigns were joke campaigns, or he was running just so that there'd be an opponent and. Uh, I don't think this time when he decided to run for delegate, he was running against me just so I would have an opponent. I think he definitely wanted to have a different uh, viewpoint that could be considered. I I feel that even though this wasn't really clear in his platform, uh, voting for him for a lot of people was in response to our recent alignment military policy and the, the stuff with Brotherhood of Malice. Obviously, he is a big part of the Raider community, and I don't think that he would be a Raider delegate, you know, to his credit, but uh, I think there was definitely, I won't call it a protest, but there was there was a clear signal that they, they weren't on board with continuing Mad Jack's vision, and uh, I thought his platform did a very good job of not leaning into that stuff. Uh, I think he gave a fair consideration. 
and made it very clear that he did take the independence of the region seriously. And I am fairly confident that had he been the winner, we wouldn't see just this flat you know, uh, 180 reversal of, of Magic's policy. I, I definitely think he would have taken time and uh, been reasonable. And I do base a lot of that on kind of knowing how he is as a person, but also I think the platform did a pretty good job of of establishing the nuance in his views. Um, I think that inexperience is probably why it wasn't as uh, lengthy or detailed in a lot of things, but there were a few things that he highlighted in his platform at specific policy he wanted to go after, and, uh, you know, Stargate was mentioned, and obviously Stargate is, is kind of one of the big things hanging over the entire electoral environment right now and our foreign policy and our military policy. So um, overall, I would say, I know it sounds like uh, kind of a backhanded compliment, but I was I was impressed with what he uh, showed uh, compared to before. And I think that maybe a little more executive experience, he can flesh it out more and, and have an even better platform for a potential future run. You had uh, two other candidates, uh, M, who also ended up uh, withdrawing, and Pathwell, who got the great amount of one vote. What are your thoughts on Pathwell's sort of lack of campaign? I have never understood why people would sign up to run for any office and then do absolutely no work on a campaign or uh, stating their case. All they're doing is taking up space on a ballot and wasting everyone's time. They they shouldn't they shouldn't sign up if they're not going to do it. That's that's not even a joke. It's not even a joke campaign if you don't run a campaign. But where's the joke? You signed your name, haha, I'm on the list. I, I don't I don't get it. I just I literally do not I don't understand. And the guy's run campaigns before. He's made platforms, so he's obviously capable of it, and he does try. So. I, I don't understand what happened here. If he just couldn't make it, couldn't you know, didn't have time, he should have dropped out. So that's uh, probably the nicest way I could put it, honestly. Before being elected as delegate, you were, if I am correct, Chief Justice, correct? Yeah, I was the Chief Justice on the court, and actually, uh, by virtue of being elected delegate, uh, left the court. I didn't. Even, uh, the term wasn't even done yet. It was. You know about halfway done so yeah that was my last you know elected position my last major job i would like to ask was it hard to debate yourself whether you should stay yourself as chief justice or to run to as delegate was it a hard decision or you were absolutely certain it would go smoothly well uh what what i will say is that the court has a reputation for being a place where people just do nothing. And that's not completely unfair because the court is a reactive body. So uh, in a lot of ways, can't do things unless other things happen first. So the risk you take when you take a position on the court is that you may not have anything to do. And I felt up until the end there that I was going to have been on the court for over a year and pretty much nothing happened and I didn't get to really do anything of note and uh, that was disappointing so in that sense very easy decision at, you know from that perspective to, to jump back into delegate and uh, you know give up the justice but again the justice to me wasn't my consideration for running at all like, I, I couldn't worry about that because I wanted to put my experience out there for delegate I wanted to give the region that opportunity and I felt that this was a time when someone like me needed to be stepping up. And that would mean if I did want to stay on the court, sacrifice in the court. And absolutely, I would do it with no hesitation. Uh, you know, towards the end there, we actually did have an opportunity to write some opinions. And I'm glad it happened, you know, at the very end, if not at all, because I, I enjoyed it a lot. I actually, you know, I, I came to the court thinking, you know, the court's been annoying lately. The there's stuff going on I, I don't agree with the decisions the way they've been handled I, surely we can go in there and we can straighten things out and make it a little less likely that stuff will happen in the future and i don't know if you remember this but i i concluded by the end of that term there really wasn't anything we could do 
to change the way the court worked. Yeah. Uh, we changed the procedures a little bit to make it easier for avoiding uh, that ridiculous scenario where uh, the prosecutor didn't submit an oath of office. So <laughs> the, the speaker uh, at the time wasn't able to be uh, convicted because the evidence didn't have his oath in it. And yeah, that was, I get it pretty ridiculous though i was like can we do something to fix that sort of thing the answer basically no we tried though uh, i did a little report on it to the ra saying that you know these are things you might want to change in the laws and they kind of were like eh, we don't want to so at that point i was like well if something comes up i'll i'll do court business otherwise you know i'm not really doing anything else and so i do miss it you know, you've been on the court before. You know when it when it, everything's going your way, when everything's happening in the court. It's fun. I liked writing the opinions. Uh, I liked getting that updated uh, decisions record. Finally, that was you know kind of a last minute rush because I was about to be elected delegate. But you know, we we got it out. So for for that, I have to personally thank you for that really accessible access to the uh, request for review index. Yeah, and that was the biggest complaint uh, when we, I think, when we moved forums, and that was what caused it. We weren't able to link straight to the decisions anymore, and there was a lot of debate about how to do that. Use a Google Doc, maybe out, you know, go to a third party. Um, I thought doing it on the forum just it was easier, and it just kind of fits better with how everything is. So, uh, I definitely consider it a work in progress. Not only because there will be more decisions, but because I think there's a lot of content you can add to it. Uh, but I trust that the uh, the current Chief Justice will uh, find ways to improve it uh, beyond what it is. I, th I think just to pretty it up, it could use a lot of work still. But, you know, for, for a basic, straightforward, click a link to the decision you want to go to, it gets the job done. Now that we're within the legal bounds of uh, what, other than your background, uh, you made it uh, one of your points within your uh, program or program. Sorry, English is hard and Spanish. Uh, bear with me. Uh, you know where I'm going. Just simply uh, saying the name of a certain bill that uh, I had to witness with my own eyes in the position I was in. I'm of course talking about the Agora Act. And you made it a point within your, uh, your campaign uh, platform. Could you explain a bit to the newcomers why, what, first, what is the Agora Act? What was it? And why did you make it uh, such a point in your, uh, com in your campaign platform to have it a, a, sim a paragraph done only for it? Well, um, I, I first have to start by, well, I guess we'll start with what the Gore Act did. It abolished the office of the Attorney General, and of course, you were the Attorney General at the time that that was passed, so you were the last Attorney General, and we've had all the memes and jokes and back and forth about that over the years, but yeah, that's what it did in, in, in a nutshell. I, I think it did a few other little quirky fixes to the law uh, as well, you know, to take away the attorney general's references and stuff and, and their role, but also I think it cleaned up a few other things that I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, basically that's what it was meant to do, was to abolish the office of attorney general and establish a much needed replacement. Obviously, you can't have nothing for prosecution, so we came up with a prosecution system, which uh, I think at, <laughs> some people would say it's clunky at best, uh, but there were a lot of things to juggle, and that bill wasn't really my idea. That actually started with uh, crushing our enemies in Sawali, and uh, it kind of went into limbo, and I picked it up and took it to the finish line. So I know I get the credit and the blame for it, but I believe that's shared. I did rewrite it significantly, but uh, I don't take credit for the, the original idea or the move to do it, because uh, you know those were others, and... I, d I don't want that to be forgotten. Not because I want them to get attacked instead, if you know if people don't like it, but because I believe they, they should get credit for it. But that's what it did, in a nutshell. And the prosecution system we've had for a while, it's had its ups and downs. Uh, 
obviously the biggest thing that we're lacking, which we've seen with a, a series of uh, R for R's that haven't been successful. Some people felt they would have been successful if they had been uh, presented by the Attorney General, because the Attorney General used to have universal standing. And uh, no Attorney General, there's no universal standing. So if you want to file an R for R, you have to be directly impacted by it, or it has to have a compelling regional interest, which is something that is a high bar to clear, the, the regional interest, that is. So uh, I think we need to bring back universal standing in some fashion, and that will be a bit of a relief to people that otherwise may not be able to get important legal questions uh, answered that need to be. And there are things, uh, and I learned this from going through the rulings archive, you'll see one in particular was the ruling that established what happens when an old ruling is, is defunct. Basically, uh, what do you do with a decision that no longer uh, stands because the law changed? Well, until you bring it to the court to reconsider it, essentially, uh, there's no way to automatically uh, negate old court rulings. So, like, the one in this case was the very first one, which had to do with the Attorney General's office, as it turns out. Uh, but because of that original decision about the Attorney General refusing to take cases, the law had changed to basically enforce what that ruling had said. So that old ruling wasn't really necessary anymore because it was a ruling on a law that had changed. And we change our laws all the time. There's a lot of rulings the court has made that relied on old laws at the time that simply don't exist anymore. So do you still need those decisions? You could argue you don't. But if you want to make that case, you got to go to the court to make that case. And how are you going to do it when you're just basically having them clean something up as a hypothetical? There's no way to do that without universal standing. Uh, the Attorney General was the one that submitted that case that got that, uh, you know, closing up old decisions, I guess. Uh, so we need something like that. And I'm not saying I would bring the Attorney General back. I believe all of my criticism is still uh, appropriate there. Uh, but we can come up with something that takes some of the old duties the Attorney General used to have, uh, old abilities they used to have, and we can put it in a new context using our prosecution system. And I think uh, that's going to be tied in directly to the other thing we've, we've been trying for a long time, which was a bar system. So I want to create a bar. Uh, I want an exam. I want the prosecutors to have some minimum level of knowing what they're doing. And crazy as it is to say this, we're, we're not, we wouldn't be the only region to do this. There are other regions that have bar exams. And they're much smaller with much smaller courts than TMPs. And I don't see why we can't do it, especially since we've had such a big legalistic culture all these years. It seems kind of weird we've never done that before. Now, uh, since we've passed that... Uh part of your platform could you before we go to the final part to the final parts in plural of the interview could you be, give us a very brief uh, breakdown of your program what you promised within uh, to be elected what you what your thoughts and ideas were before the election what you put out to the to the electorate so you mean like the platform basically pretty much Well, I've, I've kind of always struggled in this area in, in this way. I think that everything that we do is related and connected. And I've always tried to keep them all connected. So I kind of see it more as themes rather than specific uh, uh, little plans that we're going to do. So what I mean is like um, right now, Foreign policy, a huge thing on our mind, uh, dealing with the Brotherhood of Malice and, and our diplomacy. Um, so we use the World Assembly to help us with that. We uh, got a repeal of uh, condemnation of one of the leaders of uh, Brotherhood of Malice. And this was seen as a purely foreign policy retaliatory thing. It, and I made a case for the repeal, but essentially... It was a, an extension of our foreign policy. So absolutely, we want to continue to have that as an option going forward. And so the World Assembly Ministry is going to be very pivotal in working with 
the foreign affairs ministry to to see that through and our military will be doing operations that will be associated with that effort so uh whether it's you know continuing to defend stargate or to get involved in operations uh against what those raiders are doing uh i see them all kind of leading to the same place they're all working in concert with each other so same logic with the internal ministries i just did this big uh change where culture now has all of the media stuff all of the comms and radio so obviously it, you know it's easy to see how they're all connected now they're literally all in the same ministry you know working together using the same staff so that's like a very explicit example of that but home affairs you know we maybe we see in a need for more people to write stuff uh for our publications for tnl so ha can help us you know home affairs they can reach out to the nations in our region to see if there's any prospective authors or writers and if we're looking for people who want to write stuff they're right there there's an opportunity to add a line or two about getting authors in the wa and then all of a sudden ha is now assisting wa as well i i see them all looking towards the same goal home affairs will be writing press releases that basically summarize the actions that we took you know foreign affairs diplomatically uh cards we can bring them in to uh, say if culture runs an event and we, we want an incentive or we want prizes, cards can can help with that by literally uh, prevent, I ah, can't talk for some reason, sorry. Literally providing the prizes for that event. And um, obviously cards is doing that with WA, with our World Assembly Development Program. We're giving people incentives to participate more in votes and uh, endorsements, and they've been doing that. and And just it's just kind of in the background. It's not really like the big main thing Cards does. It's just one of the things they're doing. But that's an example of how they're working with the other ministries. So, uh, in that sense, I think my my platform, I did pick up on some criticism that it wasn't super specific in some areas. I believe that is why because. It's kind of more of a thematic thing for me, but uh, off the top of my head, I will throw a few specific things that I, I am interested in. I will start with uh, WA because I did mention briefly that I want to work on the pilot program we started with Mad Jack, where we were seeing ways to get the game side players involved in voting on WA uh, votes, how, how the, the delegate should vote. Because right now, you have to go on the forum and make a post. But obviously there's a lot of people that don't want to go on the forum or can't go on the forum or whatever their situation is. And they largely don't get to be part of that decision. So I want to see if there's a way for us to get them more involved in that. The, there's obviously pros and cons. One of the cons is uh, the polling system. You, you can't run more than one poll at a time. And WA votes can happen constantly, you know, every three or four days. So we have to find a way to get them involved using the tools we have with the limitations we have. It's It might be a little bit of a tall order, but it's definitely something I want to take a look at. And I, I kind of touched on this earlier with HA, with the press releases. We used to have a press office uh, one of the last times MCM was delegate. And that's kind of fallen by the wayside as HA has just kind of once again absorbed that duty into itself. Um, I think we need to see more of that. We need to be better at communicating in general. So everyone knows what's going on, what the opportunities are, what we are accomplishing. And HA, um, ironically, is the best place for that. Even though we had a communications ministry, it really wasn't for that. It was more about the publications and, and writing stuff. So um, I want to see more with, with press releases. Uh, foreign Affairs, we made a big, bold statement about our alignment doing more things, uh, more defender operations and moving away from raiding. Um, obviously, one largely untapped opportunity with that is we could strengthen ties with our allies and other regions that aren't even treated with us that are defender aligned because there's more room for cooperation with them and uh, it could open doors to uh, cultural cooperation as well. And obviously their culture would have an opportunity to help with our foreign policy. 
So you see, it's very easy to jump into how the other ministries are connected to, to each other. But I think we can make some inroads with the Defender Sphere in a way we haven't in a very long time, based on the current outlook we have. And obviously, there will be military cooperation opportunities there as well. And uh, I will, once again, stress, because we're kind of leaning in this direction, it doesn't mean that TMP is a Defender region. But as an independent region, we have the opportunity to work with other regions of both ideologies. And right now, uh, between the events of the last term and kind of the way ratings going right now, defenders are kind of naturally the, the go-to partner. So uh, we, we have a say in, in how defending works. We have a say in how rating works. When we work with these organizations, there are things we will or will not do. Uh, there are positions we will or will not take. In the case of defenders, I think it's more uh, rhetorical. With raiding, you could say, there are raids I will not do because these are destructive raids. Uh, tag raids, not, not not as bad, so we'd be willing to do those. But with defenders, since you know they're not going to obviously be necessarily destroying regions the way raiders would, it's more of, they're going to have this rhetoric about you know raiding and, and how they absolute they might be. Moralists, for example. Uh, we're not like that. We're, we would not sign on with, with those kind of uh, messages or um, efforts. So in that sense, I'd say that, that that's a lot more about words rather than deeds in the case of uh, how far we'll go in the defender sphere and what we'll be willing to do. But just to reassure everybody, you know, we're independent. I like that flexibility. That's a big part of our culture. I don't see that ever changing. Uh, you can be more defender and still not be a defender region, which is a concept a lot of people seem to have trouble with, but I will keep restating it because that is our position. All right. And moving finally to the last part of this interview. Results came in after a very surprisingly landslide of an election. 57 votes. 83.83% of the electorate put them as put you as the first option and thus you were elected. Is there something you would like to say to the 17 approximate percent of people that did not vote to you? Well, um, I get it. I'm pretty sure I understand why most of them voted the way they did. Um, I, I kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, there is a lot of there are a lot of people that didn't like the new direction we were going in with Mad Jack, and I literally was running on continuing what he was doing. So, if you were not on board with Mad Jack's ideology change or his rhetoric or his use of the, the Security Council in the World Assembly to repeal condemnation just because we were at odds of a raider, well, then I could see why you wouldn't want to vote for me since I was on board of all of those things and plan to continue them. So uh, Lord Dominator really was, <laughs> liter well, literally, he was the only other viable alternative to myself. So um, I get it. I, I'm, not, I'm not offended. I'm, I'm not thinking you, that everyone should have voted for me. I believe that the reason we give people a choice is so that they can express themselves. If they are simply voting against me, or maybe they honestly liked what Lord Dominator had to say, they, they thought the specific things he brought up were important to them, they wanted that, and they voted for that. And I would always hope that people would, per, you know, they would vote for something rather than against something, but I think they're both valid choices. So, uh, I think... I, I don't want to sound like I like I'm arrogant or anything, but I think that expectations wise, it really wasn't a surprise even to people who didn't vote for me that I was probably going to win. So the fact that they voted the way they did anyway is even more important. So if anything, I would I would thank them for doing that. That's what we want to see. We don't want to see uh, unanimous results because I don't think. I'm unanimously acceptable or even, you know, clearly 100% the best choice. I think there are things I could do better. And you've had plenty of opportunities to judge that. You've had at least three previous terms. 
if not all the other jobs I've done over the years. And when you take a big swing, and I think that Mad Jack took some big swings, and I'm willing to continue taking those big swings, uh, you open yourself up to uh, more diversity of response and people that aren't on board with it. But in a way, it's like kind of fighting against the tide right now. I, and people might be frustrated by that. So I don't hold it against them. I get it. And I'm, I'm glad they were there. I'm glad that they participated. They could have easily just sat it out. I think there were some people who did. Um, I'm glad that they they stepped up and they voted anyway. So, yeah, I guess I'm just I'm I'm grateful for it. And it's the way it's supposed to go. And I'm happy to see it. In the end, you ended up winning with a landslide again, 57 votes, 83 percent of the voters, almost 84 percent. And as a last um, question for these uh, special uh, program, I would like to ask you this. Has your results, have your results changed your point of view or has or have them, have they, sorry, have they boosted up your expectancy for the future? And if so, what do you expect to do now that you're delegate per se? What do you think the future holds for the region until the next election? Hmm. Well, um... Firstly, I would say that the easy answer, the easy thing to do is to say that you have this big majority. So clearly, uh, they want you to do everything that you said you were going to do, and they're really enthusiastic about it, and uh, you can claim a big mandate. And I think that, kind of in my previous answer, I, I have to be reflective of the fact that um, we had very specific reason why a lot of people would probably vote for Lord Dominator, but he was, you know, he had the, the deck stacked against him. So, yeah, it's a big landslide victory, but I don't think it's the same type of victory like if I had been up against someone like MCM uh, or even Ren, you know, that the, getting a landslide against one of them, that that sends a very different message than my my situation. So, I have a. I think I have enough humility to to re realize that uh, it's a big number, but the big number doesn't automatically mean you know blank check do able to do whatever you want, kind of a thing. So uh, expectations. I I'm expecting to do what I set out to do. We're going to uh, do something about our staffing issue. We're going to clean up a lot of stuff that's outdated and. Um, Reconstruction, I think, in, in some ways. Kind of like with, with what happened with the ministry, the with culture taking over media. Uh, kind of a downsizing move of sorts. We, we need to make sure our staff is in a strong position, that we have the talent in all areas, working on all of uh, the things that we need done in the region. And we're going to have to get creative. We're going to need to uh, brainstorm a lot. And... I think the lines are going to blur in a way that you haven't seen before with the ministries. I'm imagining every minister is going to be helping out in every ministry in some capacity. We're going to be changing a lot of things. Uh, we're, we're not going to be, everyone's going to not going to be in their own little bubble working on their stuff their way in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. We're going to be collaborative. We're going to be uh, handing off each other's hats to each other as needed to make sure the stuff that gets done gets done and no more of this compartmentalization where uh well that's not my ministry so i don't have to worry about it and you know fretting about how things are going in that ministry but i'm not there so i'm just gonna talk about it and acknowledge the issues but i'm not there so i don't have to actually help and that's absolutely true for the delegate as much as anyone else i'm delegating authority in areas to people so if they're not able to do it, if they're not keeping up, I can't say, well, my minister failed me. Oh, well, the buck stops with me. So I got to pick up the shovel and, and, you know, dig in holes too. I can't just so the delegate look around for people. Yeah. The delegate is delegating. 
Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, if I if I had to name a style that I had as a delegate, it was that I was free to delegate to people. I was perfectly happy having the ministers run stuff their way uh, as long as it was consistent with the overall vision I had. And uh, contrast that with someone like MCM, who is always known as a very hands-on delegate. And I've never been that hands-on guy. I, I did more of a hybrid my third term, but I think this one, I need to be the hands-on guy. And ty- people will have titles. They will be the one primarily responsible for something. But I, I really don't see that as being a strict thing. Like, those are lines you cannot cross. We will be crossing those lines because we have to. We have to make sure the region has the personnel to do the stuff we need to do, that we're still getting it done, that it's still high quality and it's consistent. You know, every ministry should be running the way that the World Assembly Ministry was running. Where, you know, we had all these votes. We had the IFBs out. It was like clockwork. We need to be like clockwork everywhere. And everything just needs a refresher. There are old uh, posts on the forum and uh, dispatches and stuff. People have been picking at them for years now and how they're outdated. I just fixed... Uh, one of the telegrams in our automated telegrams because it was touting the fact that the NPA can get up to 80 players thanks to our allies. You know, our allies plus us, we can muster 80 people like we did in the recent liberation of Nazi Europe. Nazi Europe hasn't existed for, (laughs) I don't know now, like half a decade. And we have automated telegrams that are still referencing it as a recent event. (laughs) <laughs> that we mustered 80 people. And I just saw that. And I was like, nobody's caught that before? Like, no. So I updated it. It was little things like that. It's the little things that kind of show the care and attention that, that's being done. And everybody can't just keep using all of our many tools and, and machinery and expect that it works the same way forever. It needs to be you know, maintained. It needs to be pruned, cleaned up, updated. And... We need to do stuff like that. We can't let the little things slip by because we're at the point now where we're beyond the little things slipping. The the big fundamental things are starting to slip and we need to fix that. So my expectation by the end of the term, at the very least, all the little stuff will be will be addressed because it's not even that hard to do. You know, take a little time to do it and it makes a big difference. Um, so that'll be done. I want to see the MPA... Uh, have more people in it, more enthusiastic updaters, uh, more variety of uh, operations. I want to see us making gains in our diplomatic effort against uh, the Brotherhood of Malice, seeing raiding is not going in a very bad direction. We don't want to see it going. I want to see us be able to contemplate working with the old raider organizations we used to work with. I want to see in, you know uh, independent not being us a de facto defender region obviously if it's in our interest to basically always do defending then we will but i want to see the game state change more to well (laughs) i guess i'm going to say more to tmp's liking but you know that's my job right i make sure that our will gets you know what independent independent but not indifferent well yeah but you know look at the wa for example like um If our region votes a certain way, they want a certain outcome. I want to deliver that outcome to them. So in, a, in that sense, I want it's my job to make sure that TNP's will gets done on the world stage. So I want to see that done in uh, R&D as well. There's a certain type of rating defending that we're comfortable with that we like to do. We want to be able to do it. And we, uh, I would think, would want the rest of the world to at least respect that viewpoint. One of the things that on alignment includes in it that people don't really pay attention to as much as they should is that we're talking about getting more involved in rating and defending and with defenders in particular. There's a lot of stuff in the defender sphere that TMP historically and currently isn't a fan of. And when the defenders were becoming the dominant force in in rating and defending, and we had to cut ties with the Blackhawks and Lone Wolves United, it kind of left a void that the Brotherhood of Malice ended up filling. But at the time, there was the sense that, you know, defending was so dominant as to basically be uh, 
the only real thing that there wasn't anything else that could beat it and i wouldn't say that was good for for tmp because we object to a lot of the rhetoric at the very least but also the policies that some of the big defender regions do the, the moralists in particular so i want us to show the world there's another there's another path there's another way to defend that doesn't have to just be that and i i don't want to coin a term i don't really know what i would call it i guess independent defending is the closest thing i could come up with it's kind of eye rolly though because you know duh but defending that doesn't think rating has no place in it defending that uh, recognizes that rating can be legitimate in certain circumstances and that statement lays out all the circumstances that we feel rating is legitimate and that we will do it so i don't want the defender sphere in its dominant phase hypothetically speaking to basically say if you do rating and all then that's not acceptable i don't believe that's true and i don't think tmp believes it's true and if we're going to be more active in military engagement i want that philosophy to have a prominent place in the defender sphere just like w our lack of interest in destructive rating had a place in the rating sphere so uh i feel like i kind of got away from your question a little bit there so my thoughts were unspooling but i hope that made some sense as far as where where i want things to be going you know by the time this term is over all right, and just to finish it up, uh, is there something you would like to say, not for me, not for the people here, but for the general audience, to the region itself? Any words you would like to say to the North Pacific at large? Huh. Well, um, I think that there's been a lot of pessimism in certain circles, depending on how things have gone. Every time stuff changes around, obviously not everybody likes it and uh, they, they do struggle to adapt. And for some people, the adaptation simply is impossible and they have to basically make a decision to uh, become less involved with the community and you know leave positions. I, I'm thinking in the military in particular uh, we've had some big shifts in personnel lately because of changes in policy uh, from the statement of on alignment to just how the NPA has been restructured. And that's fine. People have to do what they feel they have to do. But I do want them to remember that uh, it's cyclical. We have different people coming in all the time. Stuff changes. Some people predicted that uh, our on alignment statement will be outdated in enough time. We'll be doing more rating than defending in the end. And that that's just because Magic was delicate. So I will say that that may be true. Because if independence is, in fact, independence, then at some point you have to be willing to contemplate a future where it's not in our interest at all to do defending things or to align with defenders. So just remember things change. And uh, there are certain fundamental things I think that we all have in common that we all value that it doesn't really matter what specific little thing you that you didn't like at that time uh, you probably will find other things you do and I just hope people can continue to be friends and members of the community and get along even when they have one or two things maybe that they fundamentally have an issue with that you don't have to burn the bridge don't don't burn the bridges because you might want to cross back someday and if you burn it then you might not be able to and i think the future you will be very sad about that and uh maybe you should have enough foresight to remember that uh we've all said or done things that we end up regretting or we look back and say well i guess it didn't have to go that way and I would just, you know, as a general philosophy in life, even not just this game, just I don't like to burn the bridges. There are some times when you need to burn a bridge, but try, try not to do it unless you really have to, because life is short, but 
it's a lot longer than it feels sometimes. Thing, things will turn around. They will they will surprise you. And just don't take options away from yourself and what you can do. So that's all I would say. You know, we're all the same community. Um, you know, we've invested time here and with each other, and I think that counts for something. And don't be so quick to throw it away. So. I guess that's that's what I would say. Thank you very much, uh, Ghost, for your very for your time for your uh, sorry. Thank you, Ghost, for your time for your for giving us the time to answer for our questions and for your answers as well. Uh, this is Vivankov for the N the North uh, Northern Broadcasting Channel for the NBS, uh, presented to you by the. Ministry of Culture, I almost said Ministry of Radio, Force of Habit. Uh, thank you very much again, and we will see you next time. <laughs>